Hi, everyone. My name is Bird Running Water, and uh, I belong to the Cheyenne and Mescalero Apache tribes. And I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Australian G Consul General in Los Angeles, Jane Duke, uh, Netflix, Screen Australia's Indigenous Department, Bunya Talent Hub, and Australians in Film. Um, in my own language, in Mes the Mescalero Apache language, we would say, which means um, it makes me happy that you're here and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm glad that you're here. And so um, I wanted to welcome our guests who are on screen. And I feel really fortunate, you know, through my work at Sundance Institute to be the head of the Indigenous program that, you know, I've, I've actually met all of our guests before and I've known them for quite a while. And so I feel like this is going to be hopefully a bit more of a, of a conversation uh, that we can kind of engage in about about the amazing worlds that we all come from and the 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 amazing historic uh, notions of storytelling. I love in the video that it says sixty thousand years of storytelling, uh, which is so impressive because I do look at our indigenous cinema as an extension um, of something ancestral and something that is actually even contributing to what I would say our own creation narratives. You know, it's our own creation continually going and in process. Um, as I mentioned, I'm the head of Sundance Institute's Indigenous program. And, um, and in my work, at, I've been at Sundance for 20 years. And I feel like I think I'm one of the elders now, I feel like within within our organization and sometimes within the indigenous film world. Um, but I wanted to give a little backstory about how I first came to begin to track filmmakers in Australia and, and yeah. you know, and also to begin to collaborate. You know, uh, when I, in the year 2000, when I was first consulting at Sundance Institute, um, I attended an indigenous women in film conference in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And that's where I first met Rachel Perkins. And it was this amazing gathering of, of indigenous women from Australia, from Canada, New Zealand, uh, the US. And I was the only man there. And I have to say that I was given the honor of being uh, an honorary woman for the occasion, which is actually I held as one of my highest honors. Um, and it was such a great and powerful gathering to be there. And I met Rachel and we actually, after that showed her film, One Night the Moon at Sundance, a film festival probably around I think it was around 2002 which was one of the first film festivals that I be that I was able to program as one of the programming team at our festival <clears throat> and since then you know we've been able to really uh, become more engaged and you know through Sundance we really broadened to create you know an international indigenous film community which had kind of been kind of percolating, but we really tried to provide ourselves as a hub, you know, for this international community to really have a home and for us to collaborate, you know, across across communities, which has been so fun. And so when I attended the 25th anniversary uh, celebration of Indigenous cinema in Australia, when was that two years ago? Um, and, and that's where um, I saw a panel featuring, you know, Rachel and Ivan Sen and Warwick Thornton. And I had such a great moment of pride that those are three of the first artists whose films, short films and One Night the Moon as a feature that we showed uh, at Sundance Film Festival. So I felt like Sundance has really tried to, you know, be one of the, you know, catalysts, I think, to really helping to uplift indigenous cinema um, in the country of Australia that has really helped to travel globally. Um, you know, and one of the things that I love about the title of this, you know, of this conversation is uh, original storytellers. And one of the things that reminded me of was Taika's speech when he won his Oscar last year. And, you know, those are some of the comments that he made. Taika Waititi is also one of the first Maori filmmakers that we began to include in our work with the Indigenous program at Sundance. And so I wanted to have all of our artists, you know, first say their name and also what their indigenous affiliation is and, and the lands that they come from in Australia. Who wants to kick it off first? Um, I'm Dylan River. I am Cadich from um, a place a little bit north of Alice Springs, but I live in Alice Springs, which is right in the middle of Australia in the desert. Um, I am a writer, director and cinematographer, and I'm actually a second generation filmmaker. My mum and dad are both filmmakers. Um, my dad's indigenous and yeah, it's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you, Bird. Um, I'm Miranda Tapsell, and uh, I'm actually really um, thrilled that, you know, um, 
uh, my my Tiwi heritage. I'm a Lar proud Larrakia Tiwi woman, and um, thank and I the Sundance. I'm so thankful to the Sundance Institute and the Sundance Film Festival for bringing my film Top End Wedding um, screening there. So yes, it's so lovely to see you again, and thank you for having me. Um, hi, I'm Nikia Louie. Um, I'm a Aboriginal, my mum's Gumaroi and Torres Strait Islander woman. That's from my father. He's uh, Naji. And I'm here in Sydney, which is on the um, Gadigal land of the Eora Nation. So in my language, we say Yama. So hello, Yama. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm Shari Sevens. I'm a Bardi Jabba Jabba woman, which is uh, hailing from the sort of uh, um, northeast and west uh, most tip of Western Australia, the Gampier Peninsula. But I was very fortunate to grow up on Larrakia land, Miranda's country, and I now call Gadigal country home in Sydney. And I'm uh, Penny Smallacombe. I'm a Mata Meninji woman from the Daly River region of the Northern Territory, not far from Miranda's country, actually in the top end. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm currently living in Sydney. Um, I very much love on Gadigal lands of the Eora. Right on. Well, I wanted to kind of just begin our conversation and with, you know, I understand that, you know, a bit more. One of the things that I admire about Australia that I think is very different from the U.S. is you guys actually have this thing called state support for the arts. Um, it's something that we don't really have in the United States. Maybe we do in some limited governmental fashions, but, you know, it's not the primary ways of which you know business gets done around our filmmaking. And I don't know if any of you have really kind of begun to dabble, you know, in the American system, you know, which is like, you know, it's a billion trillion dollar system that travels around the world and invades everyone's country and screens with our with our bloody American content. Um, but, you know, it's like, I just wondered if you guys had any perceptions or about the differences between kind of like the US and, you know, Australia uh, media and entertainment systems work. Does anybody? Um, oh, look, I'll, I'll jump in because I'm the bureaucrat here, I guess, that works for the state <laughs> system that works financially um, uh, First Nations filmmakers in Australia. But look, I mean, it's, it's really hard for us to get a gauge in terms of, you know, how it is done in Hollywood, which is why it's um, really fantastic that we have Australians in film as an organisation and that we're doing the Bunya Talent Camp. I mean, we are ex essentially extremely lucky in Australia to have something like Screen Australia, to have an Indigenous unit within Screen Australia, to have state agencies, you know, create New South Wales. Um, and we also have state agencies that also employ other Indigenous um, development and investment managers. So we have um, a, a really fantastic a support system and connection and a, and a strong remit from the government to ensure that we subsidise, develop and support First Nations practitioners and the stories that they tell to ensure that we have a strong Australian and First Nations voice going out there into the world and into cinema. So, so from that point of view, we are extremely lucky, um, but it was also something that was very much fought for as well this kind of support and the establishment of the Indigenous Department wasn't just a gift, wasn't just gifted to us. People, you know, like the, the Freda Glens, um, who's, you know, Dylan Rivers' um, grandmother, and many other stalwarts from Wall Saunders and, um, you know, Rachel Perkins, and, and so many people have done amazing work to ensure that we continue to have government support. Um, so, you know, certainly I see, I see a real difference in terms of there is kind of a, a one-stop shop in which to come into, you know, being funded and supported, whereas in America it's such a different um, system of fragmentation in terms of, the, you know, the studios and the agencies. And, and so you have bigger, much bigger pots of money to make content than we do, hugely so. You have more areas to go to, of, of which we, we don't, because we are a very small industry with a, a small population. Um, but things are changing as well, you know. There is more content being funded in Australia that isn't necessarily funded by Screen Australia anymore. You know, we have the Netflixes here, you know, Amazon is about to, I think, kick in to have an office. So I think that our system is very much changing and will become a, a little bit more like the US in some ways. But, of course, I always advocate that we'll always um, and, and we should be supporting uh, Indigenous screen stories with government support. Absolutely. 
Right. Well, I kind of feel like one of the things that in terms of how I was mentioning, you know, how American content just floods, floods the world screens. I feel like a lot of countries have established, you know, their government support to really kind of maintain some sort of, you know, national identity, you know, kind of within their own, within their own cultures and within their own kind of screens. Uh, but I also kind of, I kind of suspect and wonder whether, you know, in, in kind of like, um, you know, in some of the colonized countries, whether there's there's an angle of white supremacy towards that as well, because I feel like in the U.S., you know, ours is purely, you know, a capitalistic system, you know, and it's really about what kinds of transactions can happen, you know, with 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 your story and with your content and with 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 working with you as, you know, a storyteller. And so I just kind of feel like I think they kind of still have underpinnings of of certain elements of perhaps racism or even you know white supremacy, which I think you know the shift that's happening within our our Hollywood kind of industry right now is because of the Black Lives Matter movement and and the racial reckoning that started happening. You know, I had been receiving inquiries. Um, probably, I've, did you guys hear about Standing Rock? you know, this, the standoff that we had. Okay, see, that's one of the things that traveled globally. You know, for the first time we appeared on the front page of the New York Times, probably since the 90s. You know, we were on national news programs, you know, for the first time since Dances with Wolves won all of its Oscars, you know? And so it's kind of like, there was a big pivot that happened, started to happen in our industry where I started getting more and more inquiries because you know, Hollywood executives were reading about us. Um, but then also, you know, and I, I wondered whether when Black Lives Matter happened um, with the centering Black Lives Matter, which we all continually um, got behind as an indigenous community and supported, I thought, well, there went our window. Now it's time for Black Lives and Black stories to be centered and we support that. But actually it's kind of increased dramatically. And the numbers of inquiries and phone calls that I'm getting you know, a week looking for not only Native American talent, but indigenous talent around the world. Um, I've spoken with some people who do global program and global programming and, you know, and have given names from, you know, Australia and given names from our, you know, Sami folks up in, you know, the Arctic Circle, you know, which has been kind of exciting. And so I think it's really great to see our industry starting to broaden and shift that way. And I, I'm really interested to see what starts popping up in the screen on screens you know, maybe, you know, in the next year or so. Um, and so, you know, given, I, I think maybe, I, I, that, that's kind of my perception of how we work, you know, and how I perceive our industry. But I was just wondering if you guys had an opinion about what you would change about the industries. Miranda? Uh, how, I think, well, I can't really speak for um, America, but I, I guess I'm really excited that, um, uh, that Australia has had a really uh, long legacy of in incredible Indigenous film. And um, I feel like now, um, uh, w you know, there's a lot more play with genre. Um, that's, that's what I've started to notice, particularly with, um, with uh, a Clever Man and, and Ready for This. Um, Rom-coms. So Rom-coms, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> wedding was a rom-com. So um, I think everyone's excited to see our gaze within those genres. Um, I think um, it's really exciting to see Indigenous filmmakers sort of start to play with that and make that um, be the way to um, make that accessible for a, for a broader audience because that's the biggest thing in Australia. I felt as if... Um, uh, with with um, at, at least in my experience, I've found what's been the biggest kind of hurdle has been okay. How do you make this accessible to to a, a, a whole group of non-indigenous people? And so, but I'm starting to see that that's you know a lot more people are hungry for that, and that's exciting. Yeah, look, I I mean going back to Penny and Screen Australia, she's not allowed to say, but I guess I can say that. You know that that department is underfunded for what they do, mm. and that I know for a fact that at points in time they have been, you know, um, faced with the reality of being funded less and less, you know, um, or being closed. And without that department, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing. You know, everything, every initiative I've been through, every film I've made has been made through that department. And I guess 
what I want to say is that, you know, Australia, for, for to break out of that department and make a big TV show or a really big film, like they can't fund it, even though they want to, they just don't have enough money, you know, to dis- distribute. And, you know, in Australia, you know, occasionally every couple of years, there's a big TV show being made or a big feature film, something with a massive budget that's trying to get to that world audience, to that American audience. And, you know, they're, they're great, but they don't cut through, you know, mm. things like Picnic and Hanging Rock, the remake of that um, and other feature films. But I feel like, and I can guarantee that in the next, you know, three to five years, the show that travels the world that becomes the, you know, top few shows on Netflix or Amazon will be a Blackfiller show from Australia. I can guarantee that. I believe that too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering kind of, you know, given given this, this, I guess the movement that maybe you're seeing in your country and that I'm seeing, and actually, interestingly, I have to say that, you know, the indigenous Australian community has been kind of like, I think the model, the leader that all of us other indigenous communities have followed one in terms of land acknowledgements, you know, it's like whenever I first started going to Sydney, you know, to the Message Dicks Festival that they used to have at the Opera House, you know, and I used to p- see everyone, you know, paying their respects, you know, to Gadigal lands and whatnot. I thought, God, that's so beautiful. Because um, we don't, we didn't necessarily do that back in the early 2000s here in America. And it was something that I, I started integrating into my work at Sundance. And then also, you know, um, I've gotten to meet recently Dr. Terry Janke. Um, who I know helped to design some of the first Australian Indigenous protocols for engaging around Indigenous stories and intellectual property. And then our friends in Canada at the Indigenous Screen Office designed and implemented, you know, their own protocols. And and that's something that we're starting to explore, you know, within my program at Sundance um, to see, you know, given this upswing that we're having in inquiries and all of these potential indigenous stories that, you know, the, that every, you know, network and studio and production house are hoping to tell, you know, in the next couple of years, like what kind of protocols do we need, you know, for engaging with indigenous stories? And I just wondered if you guys had any kind of opinion on, on that. I think one of the great things, like I think first and foremost in terms of, you know, protocols and 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 that type of thing, it can be such a case by case basis going down to the work. But I think having authentic voices front and center and leading the work is always going to to be incredibly important. And I think that's actually what creates a shift is having those voices telling those stories. Um, you know, in Australia, we're really lucky in terms of we with our screen, um, Australian Indigenous Unit with our national broadcasters that when engaging with First Nations content, there are protocols they need to do. But I think that having creatives front and center is what, like it creates that cultural shift. I got my first start in television writing for an open call out for a sketch comedy show called Black Comedy, which went on to run for four seasons. And I started out as a writer and ended up being a writer actor, director and co-producer. And that's that was just for an open call out where they said, are you a black fella? Do you think you're funny? Those opportunities are so incredibly rare. You get people who maybe don't have, I guess, the traditional experience, but they have something to say and they're coming from a perspective that we not we wouldn't necessarily see within our traditional story medium. So I think that authenticity of voice is incredibly important. And also I think about as a First Nations person, there's nearly a billion First Nations people around the world. That's a huge audience. So in terms of, I guess, a business perspective, the fact that like a First Nations person can maybe tap into that market that maybe, let's say, a white male running comedy wouldn't necessarily, to me, that's just good business. So I think specificity of story, but also there's audiences out there that are completely untapped. And, and that's, to me, like very important because as much as we... Get, you know people on screen we need those voices behind screen and we also need to be changing our audiences and who our consumers are and continually growing that to jump on that and sort of answer the last question as well what I, you know what i would like to see change and and what protocols need to be in place i think uh production houses we're missing a, a huge you know um pocket of the the industry which is indigenous led production houses and the shift we saw which I was, I'm very fortunate to be a part of, is very much what Nikki is saying. Like, um, I think our films, our stories took off and became global phenomenon, you know, global successes when we took the white lens away. There was no longer a white fella in charge of the, the script, the camera, anything like that. And I think I would say as a protocol, we can't go back from that. 
like and at the moment there is a because our stories have been so successful here and globally there's now been this shift where you know you do you get like sticky little hands coming in going oh maybe I want to tell those indigenous stories and it's like you're not indigenous and we've just gained control of our narrative again like we've just reclaimed it leave it with us we're no more doing um, cultural consultancy or cultural advising we want collaborators and co-writers co-producers co-direct you know if if not entirely indigenous run then I think um, for me a big protocol actually is where we should we are no longer an afterthought in projects you know here's a character I'm just going to slap indigenous in front of them uh, you know after their name and and we'll find that person when we get to them and, and get them to change the details in the script or things like that um, I think for me it's yeah number one protocol would be leave it with us for a little while longer until you start trying to get your hands on it again because we're doing it the best and that's yeah yeah I completely agree with that sis and just to add to that Bert I think that's I think that's so wonderful that um uh you brought acknowledgement of country into into um into the events that you plan um uh and I forgot to say I'm on Bunwarung and Wurundjeri country in Melbourne I'm so sorry um <laughs> uh in Melbourne but um I think when the way I was raised was that when it comes to any sort of protocol, I don't think, I think it's just about being kind and thoughtful. Um, I, um, I, and I noticed that a lot of, um, I noticed that a lot of non-Indigenous creatives, I think kind of freeze up. And I think um, what is really important for, and what, what I noticed that a lot of people that, are starting to learn is that um, no one likes to be kept in the dark with things. You know, I think everyone wants to be kept in the loop with everything that's happening, especially with your collaborating with people. So, um, so um, it's just really common sense, really just like let people know what you're doing and um, fill everyone in and make sure that they feel included in all the decision making. Oh, I was just going to say that I think everyone nailed that and, and that I'd just add that even within Indigenous people in Australia, like for myself, I get, I get sent scripts and, and I'm asked to be a cultural advisor on something. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, well, I actually get cultural advisors to do stuff I do. You know, I need that access into a community to have that advisor to help liaise with what I want to do because I'm not that connected in, in that place, you know? And so I'm very aware of what stories I want to tell that are Blackfella stories in Australia that I have access to, that I have the right to tell as well, you know? And I think it just comes down to authenticity in voice, no matter what it is, you know? I think any film that fails usually, you know, it's because the script wasn't written from an authentic point of view. I think Dylan, you, what, what you've said is exactly right, is that we, are, we have to pay attention to protocols ourselves in everything that we do. When we're filming on different lands, when we're interviewing different groups of people, I mean, the protocols that we respect because of the cultural obligation that we're under to ensure that we tell stories the way they need to be told um, is so important and, and we don't take that lightly at, at all. Um, and, you know, the authenticity is so important um, and they, Dylan is right, there will be a huge next hit from Australia is going to be an Indigenous story. You know, I mean, we could all pretty much bank on that because those are the stories that travel really, really well to international festivals, Bird, and which you would know a lot more about than me. Um, but I also just want to make that comment about like is marketplace versus uh, what is cultural and authentic storytelling and how those marry and how this we're in a really interesting situation right now. If we look at some of our big uh, TV shows um, and features, there's often been a push to have um, a big name character within that film to help financing and the market value of the film. Um, and we're, we're starting to really engage with those conversations about, okay, if we have to get a non-Indigenous character place in this film in order to get this film financed, um, what does that take away room for all the other Indigenous characters? And I certainly know on a few films, which I won't mention, um, you know, there's, there's been really robust discussions on set about if I write more lines for you, it means that I'm taking more lines away from the Indigenous character. 
And so I think that the marketplace is a little, there's quite a bit of work to be done around the marketplace um, because, you know, everyone wants to take risks, but at the same time, everyone's a little bit risk adverse, let's be honest, when it comes to financing things. Um, you want big names and in order to get big names, um, they have to have decent roles. So I think we're in an interesting kind of point where we're finding the balance and I'm hoping that we're going to, you know, leap over that hill and we can make a, a film or a TV series that has all Indigenous cast, it doesn't need a big non-Indigenous name in order to get financed because we watch a lot of content from all around the world in Australia, exactly as you said, that we're bombarded with. We don't, I don't know who half these actors are. I don't know what their background is, but I still enjoy that content thoroughly from that point of view. So I think it's an exciting time and I'm hoping we're going to leap over that next hill soon. I think it is an exciting time. And, and when you mentioned the going beyond the cultural consultant, I have to say kind of one of the things that, one of the inquiries that we get the most from, like I was saying, industry folks is, you know, they're looking for cultural consultants, you know, and, and I try to have a really difficult conversation with folks and just to say, you know what, that has been a tried and true role through the years. It's been a checklist to go through. You can say that you've done it, whether or not, you know, the work actually gets implemented, you know, into the storytelling. I was like, that's not, it's not a, um, uh, a measurable gauge. And so, you know, I was like, can we at least try to get a producer or a co, like you said, a co-writer or even a director or somebody part of the, the key creative team to really help guide a story. But also one of the trends that I really see interestingly for just specifically Native American content material come um, outsiders, industry folks coming to my office, wanting to seek some type of indigenous engagement around. Most often, interestingly, they're all period pieces. You know, it's like for Native American, Americans, like we're still trapped in the 1800s, you know, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm helping some friends with, with a contemporary TV show. And one of the things that one of the most, the biggest comment she got from high level peers in the industry was kind of really confused questions about, so this is contemporary, you know, it's like, so for us as Native Americans on our screens and in our storytelling, we haven't yet emerged out of the 1800s. You know, it's like, we've got a lot of work to do, but there have been national surveys that have, that have started to point out that. I wanted to kind of like talk about, um, you know, I, I think you guys, I, I even saw on social media that you know, there were Black Lives Matter um, marches, you know, in Australia, which I thought was really powerful. You know, it's like in my own neighborhood, I could look, go up, go to my street and look at the street and I could see marches passing down Hollywood Boulevard, you know, and it was like, it's a really a powerful and amazing time. But I just kind of wanted to get a, an Aussie point of view on Black Lives Matter and, and how that was experienced in the country. In Alice Springs here, we had a death in the community nearby where a young kid was shot by a policeman around the same time, or a li little bit earlier than that. So I think there's a lot of anger and frustration around here and a parallel kind of, I don't want to say perfectly, but at the same time as what was happening in America. And it's quite, for me, it was quite interesting because I wrote this series, Robbie Hood, where I kind of tried to stay away from the bad cop idea. I tried to write a lovable cop that is very supportive to this young Aboriginal boy and um, for reasons like for me, I went, not every cop's bad, you know, that, that's why I wrote that. I said, you know, they, they, they have their own humanity as well. And, but then, you know, the reality in this town in Alice Springs is, is there is a lot of bad cops and this shit happens all the time. And I kind of now rethinking what, what I'm doing and what I'm writing. And I'm like, I don't know, I'm kind of going, oh, fuck it. I'm, you know. Next, next show I write with that cop, I'm going to show what that cop really is. I'm going to write that character for, for the characters that I see more often rather than the nice cop. Um, and, yeah, I mean, it changes, changes what I do, it changes what we all do. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, it's something that there's an absolute parallel between Indigenous Australia. You know, we, we are blackfellas. That's, I mean, I, I know I present as a white woman, but our terminology, we've been called black since colonizers rocked up. So there's, we have, you know, instinctive kind of parallels that we draw, but we are alongside every Black Lives Matter protest in Australia is stop indigenous deaths in custody. You know, we had a Royal Commission 25, 27 years ago, I think. And uh, it's since that Royal Commission, 432 Aboriginal people have died in custody. So it's, it's, um, 
it's a movement that we get behind and we support so loudly and ferociously because it is happening to our people here. But I think the, the, what something that I'm so grateful for, and I really think it's, it's impacted the global storytelling network as well, Indigenous storytelling network, is social media. You know, we, we suddenly have access to, to political movements that are very grassroots. I mean, you know, I remember over here when Blackfellas were checking in at um, Standing Rock, you know, hashtag no DAPL. And that was our online way of showing our support in, in any, you know, in the small way that we could. Um, and what the what I, I think, you know, social media, love it or hate it, but it has connected Indigenous peoples. It has connected people of colour, Black people, brown people the world over. And um, I think, I mean, in, inherently, our, all our stories are political. You know, Aboriginal mm -hmm. arts is born out of politics. Indigenous arts is born out of politics. Our, our very existence is political. Our existence is resistance, you know. Um, yeah. So I know that it's, um, it, it's sort of galvanised what I think Black Lives Matter, the most recent um evolution you know of evolution of that movement has said it, globally like you're saying being able to look at your window but also getting online and seeing what's happening in on the other side of the world it means now we can say to organize organizations and companies and businesses you know you have to, you can't be silent on this anymore we yeah. haven't been silent forever and you cannot be silent anymore so now companies and I, I'm, I'm coming from a theater perspective as well i, I work in theater a lot and even our Sydney Theatre Company came out and said, we have to make a pledge. We have to make a pledge to do better. And it means now on their website, they've made promises that we can then in two years turn around and say, we're holding you accountable to this. Do you have 30% um, cast of colour or, you know, culturally and linguistically diverse people on your stages or behind as well? Because it's, I think we're now beyond the stage of just putting Indigenous people on screen and Black people on screen and calling it a day. And creative control on the other side is just as important. Um, but I think, you'd, I think you'd be absolutely an, a total ignoramus to, to deny the connection between social movements and, and our art, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. I know we have just a couple more minutes before we have to go to Q&A. But I just wanted to have each of you talk about what it is that you're working on next. Like Miranda, you mentioned Top End Wedding, which is your feature film that you co-wrote and starred in that we showed at Sundance. You know, Nakia, I've seen uh, Kiki and Kitty, which I loved, you know? And so I, you know, I do have, um, have experienced some of your work on screen, but I just wanted to know what each of you are working on, the, the story that you hope to tell next. Well, uh... As you know, Bird, um, Nakia is my ride or die. She is the Louise to my Thelma, the Romy to my Michelle. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so after our two award-winning podcasts and um, the final episode of Get Kraken, which was a huge comedic hit in Australia, we decided it was, we decided it was time to uh, finally get together and write a film. So we decided to write a buddy comedy called Young Aunties, Year 12 Formal. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so that's about two um, estranged best friends who travel back in time and relive the worst moment of their lives or the worst moment I think of all their lives, which is high school. Um, but for me, I, uh, I'm, I'm about to start shooting a TV show in Australia that I'm starring, writing, show running in uh, called Preppers, which is about a group of Aboriginal doomsday preppers, quite timely in our present times, but based on the idea of colonise me once, shame on you, colonise me twice, shame on me. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, and I've just been working in the US in the last year, so doing some rooms, been a writer on The Great and just signed a development deal with HBO, which has been really fun, like bringing my Indigenous perspective over to the States, which I'm really excited for. I heard about that. I met your agents at WME. Oh, cool. Did they say good yeah. things? Did you pay them oh, enough? Absolutely. <laughs> I told them they had a gem. I told them they had a gem. <laughs> <laughs> Dylan, what about you? Uh, I've got a um, few bread and butter sort of work, you know, shooting as a, a cinematographer on other people's jobs. You know, I really like doing that because I get to see other directors work and I get other people to help with their stories while I'm developing mine, you know. Um, but I've got a directing gig at the end of the year on a TV show. And other than that, yeah, just developing um, two sort of um, TV series that are kind of boiling away in my head. I've been on them for a couple of years, so just tinkering on them and hopefully get it done this year and we can make it next year. 
Right on. Uh, I'm Sorry. making the leap from acting to directing. I'm a resident hey. director this year with Sydney Theatre Company, so I'm staying true to my little nerdy theatre roots um, and uh, uh, working on a uh, my first writing and directing my first short film this year. Um, and this week we've been developing our project with the Bunya Netflix Talent Indigenous Talent Hub, um, which is a feature film that I've been sitting on for quite some time, which I'm a bit excited about. Black Kids Does Goonies, I guess, in Darwin. Um, right yeah. And, and you know, I mean, the great thing is, right at, like last year, I think we all got to sit in so many writer's rooms and develop so many stories because what, what did 2020 give us? But, you know, on this kind of format of online and being able to connect with each other. Um, so still plugging away at little things like that in between. And That's great. Directing, which is terrifying, might I add, as an actor. <laughs> Right on, congratulations. And then Penny, from your point of view as a funder, like how are things looking yeah. looking forward? Well, look, you know, like it's always fabulous when people like Dylan just, you know, speak the truth and talk about us needing more money. So, you know, <laughs> following up on that request straight away. But look, the you know, from, you know, all, all of the, the group of filmmakers that are here, uh, they're all extremely modest actually, because, you know, they've, they've got some very, very exciting things coming up in the next 12 months. Um, and I can attest to how talented they are. Um, and that, you know, that the, some of the ideas, and I'll be hearing pictures, I think this afternoon from every single one of them um, sitting by, besides Netflix there this afternoon. So I can't wait to, to hear on how those particular projects are going. Um, but look, another big year, every year, um, every year we spend more money because every year we have more filmmakers and more stories coming through. So it's, a, it's an extremely exciting time, as I keep saying. There were so many story rooms during COVID and such an opportunity, not only for writers to have time uh, to create, but also they were bringing directors into story rooms, cinematographers into story rooms. So, you know, we're starting to see a lot of development applications coming into the department of, um, you know, work that um, has been, you know, very much created in isolation but uh, truly feels like it's going to really take um, our First Nation storytelling to the next level. I've never actually seen such a broad church of stories coming in through the door, um, which warms my heart because, you know, I can get something that is about a, a frontier massacre to, you know, a, a crazy, you know, rom-com or people going back in time to relive their worst times. And as, you know, um, as Shari said, you know, like a, we all want our first um, First Nations boonies. And certainly there's quite a few large scale animations in development right now. Wow, so, yeah. you know, everyone wants to make Australia's next Moama um, and fingers mm -hmm. crossed that happens. Um, so, you know, it's a real privilege to be a tiny part of that. Um, come mid-year, my kind of my journey finishes off at Screen Australia and I will be leaping back into the um, freelance um, poor woman's world, which is going to be a very, very scary leap. Um, but I'm really looking forward to getting back out there and, and putting back on my producing pants. So, wow. you know, it's, it's going to be a, an interesting year ahead, I think, for all of us. Good for you. Well, I do have to say, like, especially in terms of, of screen culture, in terms of feature films that, like you were saying, has traveled the world into festivals and screens around the world and the marketplace. And then also kind of some of the brilliant, you know, um, episodic work, TV work that's been happening under Sally Riley at the ABC. You know, again, you guys are leading the way, you know, in terms of so much screen culture and I just want to thank you for that because it's definitely you know when I first arrived at Sundance like I said 20 years ago and I, I met these indigenous women at this conference and I I had been doing global funding work before that in Africa Asia Latin America and Russia but I started to recognize that Australia is one of those places New Zealand is a place and Canada was a place where you know that indigenous perspectives were present you know on mainstream screens you know, and I think that's something that you guys have certainly led the way in. And so I thank you for that. You know, it's definitely been, you know, um, uh, I've been able to learn so much for those of us in the United States, I think, who continue to struggle with invisibility, just a basic concept of invisibility in our own country. And so I just want you guys to know how much of an inspiration you are and, and what you give to us here in the United States. So thank you for that. <laughs> I think we can move to some questions. Online storytelling is also rising in popularity. 
how important is it for creators to explore sites like YouTube or Vimeo to tell their stories? And do you know any online indigenous storytellers people should watch? Penny, yeah, Penny I think there's a, um, oh, sorry, Dylan, you go. Sorry, I was going to say, I watch more YouTube than anything else. Um, I've actually paid for YouTube, so I don't get the ads. Um, uh, but yeah, sorry, Penny. Yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, absolutely. We're definitely encouraging and opening up to new platform relationships, which even includes, um, we're, we're, we've partnered with Instagram. We're going to do, you know, um, a partnership with Instagram to look at Instagram storytellers and creators of extremely short form content. Um, and also our online department at Screen Australia has a great relationship with YouTube. Um, if we don't start to, like, you know, support people in terms of telling stories on all of these platforms, we're, we're not going to get this younger audience learning about who we are. And let's be honest, you know, I mean, obviously Dylan is showing how young he is and youthful. You know, most of the people that I know watch YouTube as well. So those are such important partnerships. Um, and, you know, I think they're going to continue. And the online audience is something that you can't ignore. Also, I will say that the, you know, the um, inclusion equity that exists on YouTube and online audiences and TikToks and what have you, um, and the, the beautiful array of colours and people from all different backgrounds you see on those platforms is far better than what you see on other kind of broadcasters and stuff like that. So that is, that is where the cool stuff is for sure. That's great. I think what's so amazing about, um, you know, online creators, great content creators, is that they've been able to create their own audiences. There's a complete like democratization of accessibility. And I think that's been part of, you know, one of the reasons why Black Lives Matter is a movement as opposed to a moment is that there's solidarity with people around the world who are able to engage with big ideas through very simple means of storytelling. You know, when you have people out there just being able to tell a story on a phone and then get that out to like hundreds and thousands of people. You know, I know on TikTok, I'm learning about like communism from a biracial queer girl in the States and like he's 15. Uh -huh. And I kind of think that's amazing. I think there's something really, like a really big lesson. And, and I wonder what I, I, as a, as a, I guess a filmmaker, I just wonder what that crossover with audience is. And, and I would love to be able to get my ideas across as succinctly and, um, and, and, and fun and entertaining as, as a lot of these people who are using these mediums are. I really think it's such a powerful tool. And you had, you had uh, Kiki and Kitty, which was, which was a webisode series. Was that like in terms of black comedy, was that before, during, after um, in terms of timeline? And what was the engagement like on that? Yeah, so that was, um, uh, I think, after our second season, I filmed that, and then we cut it for TV, and so it okay. aired. And the engagement was, um, it was, it's it's a tricky medium, that kind of web series beast, um, you know, within Australia, within our networks, kind of fluctuated in terms of ABC comedy, which doesn't exist anymore. It's like finding that kind of market. But the yeah. engagement was really, like, it was surprising. It, 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 we got a, we got quite a, um, quite a little bit of a cult following and and then that did the festival circuit and we won a few awards at series mania and stuff like that but yeah. it was really great in that as a you know coming from um like I was a playwright doing black comedy being able to be creatively the center of a project but it be like fairly low budget but then be able to tell a kind of a full story arc and do like a six episode um, and not have to, it was really fast, to be honest with you. So in, in terms of that, it was a really great exercise and a really great learning experience because it takes a really long time to get shows up in Australia. And I think around the world, it takes a long time to make a movie. I mean, I was able to get the approval like uh, the, in the show wrote within a period of a year before we started filming. So we're in that, in terms of that, being the creative core, being the voice, within a short period of time and then having a product, that kind of bite-sized product was was a really useful way to do that. Well, I just wanted to give you guys a moment to, if you wanted to make a closing statement before we have to wrap up in the next couple of minutes. Um, I would like to say, get involved in Native American storytelling more. I mean, I'm not getting involved, but 
saturate yourself more. I mean, one of the great things about social media for us, Mob, is we've got access now to, we can follow the journey of Native American writers, directors, DOPs, the, the people I follow on my social media accounts that are telling Native American stories that I didn't have access to 10 years ago. I just go, there's no excuse. Like, you know, you're saying you're so thankful for, for what our influence has had over there, but I know that there is so much good to come out of your nations over there. And I, um, yeah, I just, I think it's something that we're, we're on the precipice of all this great potential for storytelling and it's happening globally. And I just, you know, absolutely support our work, but also get behind what's happening. Like whose land are you on today? Start there. Mm. It's so simple. Whose land are you on? And like, like you said, acknowledgements, I think it's all, it's all intrinsically linked. Um, yeah. That kind of connection yeah. and, and acknowledgement. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to follow with Shari and that, you know, you're all standing, like, go find out whose land that you're on. Go find out about your local community. If you want to listen to our stories, those stories start where you are right now. There's a wealth of local knowledge and history that goes back far beyond what we kind of consider history. You know, we're looking, you know, in Australia, like 60,000 years of stories. And you can find yeah. that just speaking to the community around you. So just knowing how to say hello, knowing the land that you're on, that's such an important step. I'm going to yeah. jump in one more. Bring back Trickster. <laughs> it is so <laughs> that show was cancelled because of, I, you know, it's I so know. It, it's heartbreaking that that show was cancelled and the work of so many Native American yeah. creative has been thrown yeah. in the bin because of that debacle. If anyone's on here with the money, the money do it. Bring it back. We want it. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. And and in this, what makes this climate so exciting is that everyone can now see the difference between when, uh, when the people, the filmmakers from in front of and behind the camera are telling their story as opposed to someone else telling it for them. You can, there is a really stark difference and... Um, the people who, uh, the audience that you're trying to sell it to will know when it's, when it's not right or when it's not authentic because they've lived that life. Um, that's their gaze. So um, I think that's just, that's just, that to me, that's just smart filmmaking now and that's what everyone's starting to pick up on. So, um, yeah, also, also find those, like, when you watch uh when you watch our stories you can see that it's 100 percent yeah thank you i think um, i'll just i'll just lastly say that um i think that you know to our broader audiences um you know one keep an eye out for these names dylan river nakia louis miranda tapsell shari sevens um content will be coming to you on a multitude of platforms Two, I think, you know, partnerships like the one we ha currently have with Netflix, um, which is about professional development, is something that we're always interested. Um, so if there are people out there that want to support our professional development of First Nations storytellers in Australia, New Zealand, you know, wherever it is across the lands, um, we are always looking for partners in that area. And it's certainly a time where it's, you know, it's time for people to actually lean in and really start to listen to First Nations people to tell these stories. Uh, there was something I read, uh, something on social media that, you know, spoke about just our knowledge, our Indigenous knowledge systems of even land preservation, all of these other issues. Um, and, you know, Indigenous knowledge isn't kind of a plan B for the earth but actually it is the plan. So we've got storytellers and we've got people that are trying to inform you through entertainment as well. So, you know, uh, pay attention and look out for it. Right on. I have one, I have one last question from our producers. Do you all have social media platforms here for that, that you can name that people can track you down on whether Twitter or Instagram? Oh, yeah, totally. Do like, to <laughs> yeah. Everyone's going, do I want to say my username out loud? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we do. 
<laughs> oh, you're in the chat. Your mob's loud in the chat. <laughs> I know all these mobs. I can give them all their plugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, well um, maybe we'll find a way to follow up with our audience if you're being shy. Well, I'm on Instagram. I'm Miss Tap. M I double S T A P. <laughs> okay. I'm just, this is so basic, but just Nikia Louie on Twitter and then <laughs> on Instagram got in first. <laughs> yeah. I'm on, mine's cloud spotting on Instagram <laughs> because I'm obsessed with clouds. Um, and on Twitter, I'm Shari Lee Sebo, which is a nickname ish thing. But yeah, type my name and we'll come up. <laughs> okay. Dylan? Uh, your mind's too hard, but you type my name and I'm sure it might come up. <laughs> well, my name was too long for, for social media, mm -hmm. so I had to shorten it by saying Bert, at bird running H2O. Uh, <laughs> my, whole, my whole name wouldn't fit. Well, I just really want to thank you again. You've been so generous in sharing your thoughts about, you know, about the world and the industries and, and moving forward. And it's been very inspirational. I also want to thank our audience for joining us as well. Thank you so much, you know, and um, we had a really good following today. It's been my, my, I was getting a bit more anxiety as I kept seeing the number on my screen, tick, 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 go up and up and up. So um, I hope that you guys made some really great influence on our audience today. And thank you everyone for joining. 